Tonight, we proudly present Velociraptor Mongoliensis, a tale of prolonged paleontological obscurity and abrupt meteoric fame. Today, that very popularity has made it an ambassador for science, the new feathery face of Dinosauria in the 21st century. And now, this human. A bunch of people have sent in Velociraptors. Uh, I want to thank Alec, who works for the St. George Discovery Site at Johnson Farm. Uh, they, they have the Dinosaur Auditorium there, which is a good name for a facility. I want to thank Alicia, uh, Michael, Dylan, uh, Thien, uh, Laura, and Keith, and one other person who remained anonymous. And if there's anybody else who sees their toy here and is like, you didn't name me, I am preemptively sorry and please comment in and thank you. Velociraptor is kind of unique among dinosaurs that we've covered so far. Uh, most dinosaurs that have household name recognition, we have known about them for as long as they have been popular. So like with Tyrannosaurus, you have a century of tropes that it has acquired over the years and most of them are wrong. But with Velociraptor, its popularity is extremely recent. Uh, they've only really become a household name after the Jurassic Park films, so they are post-Renaissance, post-dinosaur Renaissance, uh, dinosaurs. And because in the Jurassic Park films they were portrayed as active, birdy animals, that is the, the baseline that we start from. Which is unique, like you, you'll, we have one toy here that has a Velociraptor dragging its tail. You almost never see a toy with Velociraptor dragging its tail, for instance. Now, while Velociraptor has been the topic of ongoing research in the last 30 years, it wasn't until really recently that its pop cultural presence has started to become unfrozen from where it was in those films. Because Velociraptor is so popular, most people that care what a Velociraptor is have also heard, at least, that scientists think that they had feathers now. So it's interesting that Velociraptor, fairly, I would say, has become sort of the emblem of the 21st century evolving, changing view of dinosaurs' life appearance. So in 1990, when the filmmakers set about creating what for many people is still the definitive Velociraptor, what did they decide on? Well, they decided they have a really large body size, they have scaly skin, reticulate scales, they have their hands, which can open doors, held out like this, as many of these toys are doing, where it kind of looks like how a raptorial bird holds their hands in flight, how like an eagle holds their talons. Hands. Feet. Their eyes have slit pupils. A lot of these toys have slit pupils, even the ones that aren't explicitly Jurassic Park. That is... I'm surprised, frankly, how much purchase the slit pupil look has had with Velociraptor and with other dinosaurs in popular culture that are that are clearly drawing on Velociraptor. You always see them with slit pupils. And the head is this vaguely Allosaur-like head. It, it doesn't really look like a Velociraptor head. It looks more like a more basal theropod, like some kind of carnosaur head, just maybe lengthened and lighter. As it happens, the Velociraptors in the film and in the book were really Velociraptor in name only. Uh, as I mentioned, Deinonychus, uh, Michael Crichton was using Deinonychus in his book, but decided that that wasn't a dramatic enough name and went with Velociraptor. And with apologies to Ostrom, I am inclined to agree. <laughs> Velociraptor is just an inherently cooler name, and I would be lying if I said that I didn't think that that was a big part of why they've become so popular. But even if the filmmakers had wanted to make just the most accurate Velociraptor possible in 1990, they would largely have been drawing on Deinonychus. And now that I've said that, it might surprise you to learn that we've known about Velociraptor for almost 100 years, and we've had a complete skeleton since the 70s. So why is that? We have a lot of material now. Why wasn't it better known in 1990? Well, the short answer is that they're from Mongolia. Specifically, they're from the Jadokta Formation, uh, the most popular location of which is Bayan Zak, the Flaming Cliffs. 
This is Campanian rock, about 75 million years old. There's also a slightly younger formation that has a species of Velociraptor, um, Barungoyot. And I believe we've also found material from the Bayanmandahu formation. So the history of Mongolian paleontology is one of physical, political, and economic barriers. The Gobi Desert is fossil rich, and the fossils we recover from it are really well preserved. They're, they're often preserved in three dimensions instead of being squished down like you usually find. But the Gobi Desert is not a great environment for humans to be working in. You can't work there at all for almost half the year because it's winter, and then in the summer, you're in the Gobi in the summer. So it's an expensive proposition to go out and prospect for fossils. So Mongolian workers have basically always had to uh, go to foreign institutions uh, to collaborate. The first such institution was the American Museum of Natural History. Now, a century ago, very few geologists had even been to Mongolia, and some thought that the rock there was not fossil-bearing, which is called unfossiliferous, which is hilarious in hindsight now that we have so many dinosaurs from there. Um, but Roy Chapman Andrews and his then-wife Yvette Borup Andrews and their automobiles, those newfangled contraptions, had the means to go and fossil hunt there. In an automobile, the team could cover ten times the ground that a camel caravan could. So what they wound up doing was they had the camel caravan go through the desert through a, a known route, uh, carrying gasoline and water and food and other supplies, and then they would go out in their cars and use nautical navigation techniques to go out into the desert, then double back and meet the caravan at a predetermined point. So it was quite an undertaking, and I can go into as much detail as I have because it was extensively documented. Um, AMNH has a bunch of material from this expedition online. Uh, uh, Yvette's job was to photograph and film what they were doing. Uh, and you can see some of those photographs and films. Roy Chapman Andrews wrote books about this expedition, which you can find on archive.org. Uh, it, it's a really interesting little tidbit of history. Uh, that first expedition in 1922 recovered uh, the first ever dinosaur eggs, and mostly was just looking for promising sites to visit the next year, which they did, and they brought more paleontologists, including one Peter C. Kyson, who is the one who on August 11th of 1923 uh, discovered the holotype of Velociraptor. That was sent by Camelback to China, and then by ship to America, and I presume by train to New York. I'm mentioning all of this because it's really impressive the turnaround here, because in 1924, Henry Fairfield Osborne, the then president of AMNH, uh, 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 published a description of Velociraptor. It was a very brief description, and it didn't go into a lot of detail about the morphology of the skull, but at the very least we had a skull and the associated jaw. It was a little bit crushed, but still recognizable as Velociraptor. And we had the thumb claw and the first bone attaching to the thumb claw. Initially, Henry Fiefford Osborne wanted to call it uh, Ovoraptor, I found out. Uh, but then he later changed it to the, in my opinion, much better Velociraptor. The general impression that you get from Osborne's initial description is of an animal very similar to Ornitholestes. Um, it's, it's just a small-bodied, fast-moving uh, theropod carnivore. There's another animal described at the same time, a troodontid, I believe, called uh, Sorornithoides, which is interesting. Osborne kind of recognizes the avianness of it, hence the name, Ornith. Um, he wavers on whether it has megalosaurian or avian affinities, but then also he says that it's the more sluggish of the two, that, that Sauronithoides is raptorial, whereas Velociraptor is super raptorial. And by raptorial, what he's meaning is the, the actual action of using their hands to snatch things. That's what raptor literally means, is snatcher. There is occasional resistance to the use of the term raptor to refer to these animals, which everyone does now anyway. Um, ornithologists will insist that, no, it's birds of prey. And, not, and birds of prey doesn't specifically mean all predatory birds. Like, penguins are predators, but 
nobody would call them raptors. I did an engram search of raptor and some related terms, and I found that it wasn't until the 1969 description of Deinonychus that raptor really starts to become popular. Um, by the late 90s, it is more popular than raptoris, the, the formal Latin uh, term ever was, which I think must have been the ornithology term. And in any case, raptor was always less common than raptorial, the, the adjective describing actually grabbing things. So based on that admittedly not terribly scientific uh, uh, survey, I would think that the current popularity of the term raptor is the dromaeosaur usage. So anybody who's insisting that we should only use it for birds of prey is perhaps well-meaning, but also perhaps out of touch. Another thing I found in that engram search is that velociraptor itself was not popular at all until the 90s. The reason for that is probably because Americans would only have that head and thumb for quite a while. The last expedition to Outer Mongolia, I believe, was in 1925. Um, we stopped going to Central Asia at all in 1930, possibly owing to the Great Depression. Um, but Mongolia at the time was also aligning more firmly with the uh, Soviet Union against China, and we were approaching Mongolia through China. The Mongolian Academy of Science did reach out to the Soviets instead to come out and do fossil prospecting in Gobi, but they reached out in 1941, so that had to wait. After the war, in the late 1940s, uh, the Soviets did indeed send three expeditions led by Ivan Efromov, who you may remember from our Therizinosaurus and Tarbosaurus episodes. Those are the expeditions that brought those animals back. These expeditions were dividing their attention between the Jadokta Formation and the Nemegd Formation, and you can see why they would want to maybe focus on the Nemegd, where they have the huge impressive animals uh, that are not Velociraptor, though they did recover um, Pinacosaurus. Pinacosaurus from <laughs> Jadokta during this period. It was in the 1960s and 70s that Poland, of all countries, reached out to Mongolia to go back to Gobi. They mounted a series of expeditions involving some familiar names. We have Halska Osmolska and Rinchen Barsbold working on these. They do recover the first postcranial uh, elements of Velociraptor, though as far as I can tell they weren't recognized as such. Uh, and then in 1969, of course, we have Ostrom's description of Deinonychus, which allows us to fill in a lot of dromaeosaur anatomy and allows us to say, hmm, this is really different from Ornithalestes. This is a much more bird-like animal. Then in 1971, right after that, we find the fighting dinosaur specimen, which we will talk about at length, but is a fantastic specimen uh, in its own right, but also because it has an articulated velociraptor within it. That is not fully described, however, until 1983, and scientists in our part of the world knew that this work was going on, but wouldn't necessarily have had access to the findings. Um, there were not a lot of opportunities for Soviet and Western scientists to communicate with one another. There certainly weren't a lot of opportunities for them to collaborate. I found that even nowadays, researching for this episode, there's still some stuff uh, some material on Velociraptor that is only available in Russian, or at least the online copies are only in Russian. So how much harder must it have been in the 70s and 80s to try to, to research this animal? But then the 90s happened, and within weeks of Mongolia declaring their independence from the USSR, the Mongolian Academy of Sciences once again reached out to the American Museum of Natural History, who mounted a series of expeditions throughout the 90s. I believe they went annually out to Mongolia. By this point, the Jadokta Formation, or at least Bayanzak itself, uh, had been pretty well picked over. If you go there today, it's actually a tourist destination. There's some truly ugly dinosaur statues there. But it was during those 1990s expeditions that we recovered a lot more Velociraptor material, and we finally got a complete description uh, in 97 and 99 by Dr. Novacek. So it just so happens that right when Velociraptor is exploding in popularity on the world stage, the world scientific community is able to properly study them. Now, the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park were scaled up to a kilobator size about, but they didn't take into account the allometric differences that happen when you have a large-bodied dromaeosaur. Like, you can't just take a Deinonychus and scale it up to that size. Now I suspect 
in addition to the storytelling constraint of you want a big scary animal, um, they also had production constraints because they needed a puppet that the puppeteer could be inside to act out some of those scenes in the movie. The problem is that results in people seeing the actual size of Velociraptor and being like, that's it? And they're not small dromaeosaurs, they're about medium size, they're about two meters long and they would have weighed maximum probably 20 kilograms but maybe more like 15 kilograms. So I like to compare them to a coyote or a medium-sized dog. Uh, it might be better to picture them as maybe a big swan or a really big turkey. That kid in the movie when he said that they're six-foot turkeys, he might have been onto something. Now we can actually divide these toys pretty clearly between those that are trying to represent Velociraptor as an animal and those that are basically just aping Jurassic Park. So even this toy, which is a pretty accurate Velociraptor anatomically, other than the lack of feathers and the pronated hands, has done the Jurassic Park thing where the head is basically a big wedge. And that's really pronounced in some of these other ones that are frankly not trying as hard, where you have a, a big old triangle shape for the head. Velociraptor was hey, pretty narrow snouted. This toy does it fairly well, where it's, it's a very narrow tooth row that then widens once you get to the eyes and the cranium. Barsbold recognized in 1983 that there was, seemed to be two clusters of dromaeosaur morphology where some were high-skulled, like Dromaeosaurus, and some were narrow-skulled, like Deinonychus or like Velociraptor. Now, Jamie, or Jaime Hedden, has a post where he goes into a lot of detail about the flesh on dinosaurs' faces, and he points out that the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park, none of these toys really do it exactly right, but this one is probably the closest. They have, I don't know if you can see it, but they have this pretty narrow tooth row, which is accurate, but then they have all of this flesh packed on around it to, to build up the head to become this more carnosaurian looking shape, which makes it even weirder that on, it's, it's, you don't really see it on this guy, but on guys like this, you still see the antorbital fenestra's outline even through all of those layers of flesh. It's very strange. Furthermore, in profile view, the skulls that are taking cues from Jurassic Park have either a pretty flat area here or even a convex area here going from the top of the head to the tip of the nose. Whereas in Velociraptor, the nasal is much more depressed. There's, there's sort of a concave area. Now, I can't prove this, but it would be interesting if the filmmakers specifically chose to go with an outdated rest reconstruction because it looked stronger. By the time that that movie was in production, Gregory S. Paul had already updated um, Deinonychus's reconstruction to have a, a somewhat longer and more depressed uh, nasal area on the skull. If you look at the older reconstructions of Deinonychus before we had found an intact skull, um, it, it is much more like this guy in the head area. What's interesting is those aforementioned high skull dromaeosaurs also have um, tooth serrations that lead us to believe that they were using their mouths as their primary weapons more so than a Velociraptor would be. Velociraptor would primarily be using its limbs. Uh, its, its mouth was just for eating, so its skull didn't need to be very strong. So I would just say that when the filmmakers made those decisions to try and make uh, Velociraptor's skull look stronger, their method was sound because selection pressure made dromaeosaurs take the same route. Now, as I mentioned, it's really common to see a situation like on this toy or to a lesser extent on this toy where there are really clearly lips around the tooth row. Lips are something of a contentious topic right now for dinosaurs. The technical term is extraoral tissues and the question we're trying to answer is what was their extent 
and how pliable were they. In the absence of a beak, uh, diapsids have bands of ligaments around their mouths. In dinosaurs' close relatives, the crocodiles, those bands are tight, so the teeth are exposed, and the lips are basically a second set of gums. In more distant relatives, like lizards and tuataras, the bands are looser, and the teeth are covered by lips when the mouth is closed. Workers have attempted to map certain tissues to certain bone structures or bone textures, which is why we see the term osteological correlates when we're talking about this topic. In crocodiles, the edges of the mouth bones are rounded off. The skull has a rough texture with many, many holes called foramina. In more distantly related reptiles, the edges of the mouth bones are sharper and have a smooth texture. Uh, with few holes, usually in nice, neat rows. Now, Velociraptor's skull looks more like the lipped condition. Notice the foramina along the bottom of the mandible line up with the tips of the upper teeth when the mouth is closed, which would imply that if there's a lip there, that's where it anchors. So it's a, it's a pocket for the teeth to slide into. Now, because their living relatives, the crocodiles and the birds, uh, the, the bracket that we put around non-avian dinosaurs have evolved away from the archosaur condition, uh, and in different directions, I might add, uh, we don't know what dinosaur lips would have looked like. We don't know for sure that they looked like monitor lizard lips, which is what the Jurassic Park creators chose. Maybe they didn't have a distinct row of scales there. Maybe their lips were weird. Uh, maybe they were tight and firm near the tip of the snout, but then more pliable towards the back of the mouth, for instance. So, it's kind of hard to tell, but in this toy, it would seem like the, the ligament bands are pretty tight. Like, it, it looks like if this animal closed its mouth, you would still see its teeth. And obviously this one does have its mouth closed, and you do see its teeth. I cannot at this time say that it is wrong to restore it this way, but you should be cognizant of the decision that you're making if you choose to have the teeth exposed with the mouth closed. Since we're talking about the flesh of the face, we may as well talk about the stuff poking out of the flesh, namely the integument, the fuzz and scales and feathers. We know from related animals that have been preserved with uh, feather impressions that this toy has the right idea, where there are feathers or fuzz in front of the eyes that then leave off, and then there's scales, or possibly skin, but more likely reticulate scales, uh, on the snout. You'll often see... We really only have three feathered toys, but you can see here they have chosen to have the, the skin or scales be a very different color than the feathers are. That does sell the idea that these are bird-like, because if you look at a bird, their feet and their beak will be yellow or whatever, and the rest of the bird is a different color. It's not necessarily the case that the scales would be a dramatically different color than the feathers, though. So again, just be cognizant of the decisions you're making. Both of these have crests of feathers. Uh, this toy has weird sort of scaly brow crests. And they're subtle on this toy, but you can see that it has the Jurassic Park-like crests running on the uh, edges of the, the, the sort of corners of the face that they've put there. All of these are reasonable. Again, I would caution using these particular ridges just because those are the ones that looked nice in Jurassic Park. But, uh, and, and I, I question like the sculpt here. These don't really look like any feathers I've seen, but conceptually there's nothing wrong with there being hackles or other kinds of crests on the head. As of 2019, we might actually expect there to be even more uh, uh, wattles or crests or other structures on top of the head. Because there was a paper looking at these peculiar hollows on the tops of archosaur heads where blood could be exchanged between the inside of the skull and the surface of the skull. And this could be uh, functioning as a radiator to exchange heat. Um, it could also, or 
It could be amplified by having blood-filled structures on the head, whether that's uh, caruncular skin like you would see on something like a turkey, whether that's waddles or snoods or any of these other really fun terms for the various parts of a bird's face. Combs, combs is a good one. So what if the entire head and neck might be naked like a turkey or a vulture? Well, there's a common belief that vultures' heads are bald because they have to stick their heads into carrion and it helps them keep them clean, and maybe, but it's been found that it's actually for thermoregulation. Vultures, in some parts of the world, will go from a very hot temperature at the surface and then take off and fly up into the atmosphere and they've dropped 30 degrees or so. Um, so what they can do is, if they're too warm, they extend their neck out of their feathers and that cools them off, and if they're cold, they pull their neck back in and it's insulated. It's been found that turkeys as well have thermoregulatory benefits to having a naked head, though not to the degree that vultures do, because as far as I know, turkeys do not soar up into the sky. Uh, but they found that Turkey's southernmost range, which goes down into Mexico, actually is extended by having a naked head because they can thermoregulate in those very hot temperatures. So for an animal like Velociraptor, a feathered dinosaur living in uh, an arid environment like the Gobi was back then, interestingly, the Gobi in the Campanian was fairly similar to the Gobi today. You had arid to semi-arid environment with sand dunes and high plateaus and uh, what we call flats in America, seasonal lakes. Um, it's an environment of very hot temperatures but probably very cold nights and this feathered dinosaur probably would have an advantage if it had a, a caruncular patch on its head or if it had a naked neck that it could pull back into its chest feathers. So yeah, I would say it's not unjustifiable. Six foot turkey. I hope I don't have to belabor the point that these were feathered animals. Even if we did not have direct evidence of feathers in Velociraptor, we would infer it because we have related animals with evidence of feathers in the form of impressions, and we can bracket Velociraptor between them and say, yes, this is a feathered clade. However, we do have a Velociraptor ulna, which is a bone in the forearm, which has knobs on it, which are very similar to the knobs that we see in some birds, and those are anchor points for the quills of wing feathers. So we can at least say that Velociraptor definitely had feathers on its wings with quills. So with the, the calamus in the center of the feather. And it's reasonable to assume that if they have feathers on their wings, then they must have feathers elsewhere on their bodies. What is less clear, or at least is open to some degree of interpretation, is the extent of the feathering and what form of feathers is on what body part. It's kind of up to the artist where you stop the feathers on the legs. Um, sometimes you see them all the way down to the toes. Uh, more often you see it just like this, where it stops above the ankle. Um, it's unlikely that we would see feathers on the feet like we have in uh, Microraptor or Anchiornis. Less clear whether we would see leg wings like we see in Archaeopteryx or indeed Microraptor. It's difficult to say what purpose they would serve in Velociraptor unless there was some weird like brooding thermoregulation purpose or again if it might be for display. What we also don't know is the extent to which the feathering would modify the contours of the body. So the more modern toys here, whether they have feathers or not, are showing an accurate Velociraptor chest. The, the torso of the animal was not what you see in toys like this, uh, a, a barrel or cylinder. Um, it was much deeper top to bottom than it was side to side, which you can see pretty clearly on the unfeathered one. But even on the feathered one, you can see um, this one has more of a bristly dino fuzz covering, and you can clearly see the contour of the body underneath it. Whereas this one, it's more obscured. And you could actually push that even further. You could have just like a maximum fluff velociraptor, but I don't know that that would be particularly reasonable. It really depends on whether it had um, contour feathers, like structurally feather feathers, 
um, or something more like down or dino fuzz, uh, uh, whether that would create that volume. So a tentative, sort of safe, middle of the road feathering for a velociraptor would be something pretty similar to this, where you have pinaceous feathers on the wings and on the tail, you have contour feathers or down on the body and the uh, uh, upper legs, you have dino fuzz on the face and lower legs. I called them wings earlier, but should we? They, they definitely look like wings, but using that word would imply that they have some kind of uh, aerodynamic function, that they could flap or, or use them for um, maneuvering through the air. Uh, they definitely could not flap. Velociraptor could only raise their arms to the sub-horizontal position. Their shoulder socket actually offered them less range of motion than Deinonychus did. So it would seem that if, and that's a big if because this is up for debate, Velociraptor's ancestors were flying or climbing, they lost that ability in favor of being able to grab onto things underneath them and kick them to death. Uh, to that end, they have the what's called uncinet processes, those barbs that you sometimes see on dinosaurs' ribs. Those help the rib cage maintain its structure, but also help the breathing muscles and shoulder muscles do a better job. In other words, they, they had the musculature that you would expect if they were dealing with vertical stresses with their arms. And the question that raises is, how good at grabbing things were their hands? How apt is Osborne's designation of them as super raptorial? Well, Center in 2006 looked at uh, Bambi Raptor and Deinonychus, which are two Velociraptor relatives, and specifically was looking at how their hands worked and how they were able to grab things. He found that they could grab things with both hands underneath the body with their wrists retracted. They could grab things against the far side of their body with the opposite hand, which feels like the Darkwing Duck pose, which is, I might want to call the shadow pose, but I don't know if anybody will even get Darkwing Duck references at this point. Uh, but he found that they could not extend both arms and both wrists and grab with both hands because extending the arm and the wrist supinates the hand. We've talked a lot about pronating the hand, which is where it turns like this, which they could not do, but it turns out that they could, or indeed had to, supinate if they were extending their arm all the way out. Speaking of pronation, we've uh, talked about this in almost every episode, but you'll notice that all of the Jurassic park e toys here have the classic hands facing downwards pose, whereas all of the more modern toys have the more correct uh, hands facing each other pose. And also this one has its hands facing each other. So I guess I have to give it points for that. And for nothing else. And we've mentioned so many times that they could not hold their hands that way, but I don't think we've ever mentioned why that's such a popular trope still. It just kind of looks right, is my opinion. Uh, when artists were trying to convey, okay, this is a, a weapon, this is a hand used for grabbing at things, they looked at living raptors. They looked at how an eagle holds its talons or how a hawk holds its talons, which looks pretty similar to this. This one has really long hands like you would expect in a velociraptor, but these ones that are less concerned with getting the anatomy right just kind of default to making it look, oh, just kind of default to making it look like hawk talons. And I think that's the intent, and I like that they're using a bird reference instead of a lizard reference for, for dinosaur limbs. That's refreshing. Unfortunately, it's also wrong. So the next question you might have is, if they're having to grab things with both hands, are their primary feathers, the feathers on their hands, affecting how their fingers work? Well, with regards to grabbing things, Center certainly seems to think so, that the, the primaries would get in the way. As you can see on this toy, the fingers are separate from the wing. The 
primary feathers are anchored to the second finger here. It's a little hard to tell, but that's what they're doing. Um, but the fingertips are not like encased in a mitten of flesh the way that you would see in a modern bird. Uh, they, they can still move independent of the wing. That has implications for their integument. We have laser fluorescence of Anchiornis, uh, a more distantly related animal, that shows that it did have reticulate scales on its finger pads, which is the, well, it's the pad, same, where, same place that your finger pads are. We don't necessarily know, but we assume that there were reticulate scales on the backs of the fingers as well. We don't think they had an alula, the, what's called a bastard wing, on the thumb. Uh, there would be no reason to have one since, it, as we established, it probably wasn't using its wing for aerodynamic purposes. I don't know how reasonable it is to have what this toy has, which are scoots on the fingers. We know from evolutionary developmental biology that scoots are modified feather cells, so it does make a certain amount of sense to have scoots there, because if you're going to have flight feathers growing out of the fingers, um, at a certain point you have to turn those off and turn them back into scoots so that you can use the finger. However, some of these toys take that idea too far. This is probably the best example, because this is what I see all the time. It's sort of a feather sleeve, but then a completely featherless hand. And you won't see that. We know that feathers develop at the fingertips first. So you could potentially have, I don't know if we found any, but you could potentially have a dinosaur with feathered hands and not feathered arms, but it would be extremely surprising to find one with feathered arms and no feathered hands. Now you may raise the objection, Stephen, look at their feet. Their feet clearly have scoots, which means that they have secondarily turned off the feather genes, which means that they could have just done the same thing for the hands. And that's an excellent question. I don't know of any work on this. It feels like something that we could experimentally test, like take a bird and turn off the genes for producing feathers on its fingers and see if it gets scoots like on its foot. Uh, I don't know of any work going on in that area. So I, I will tentatively say that it's not genetically impossible to have featherless hands, but as I just said, it would be extremely surprising. Furthermore, the, the pressure, the selection pressure to lose the feathers on your foot if they were ever present uh, is much stronger than to lose it on your hands in a bipedal animal because your, your feet are always on the ground. You're going to have to constantly be cleaning those feathers. You're probably going to break those feathers really often, whereas your hands, since you're not walking on them, way lower maintenance. What's pretty unclear is exactly how long the primary feathers, any of the wing feathers really, should be in Velociraptor. We can look at related animals, and indeed we do. We have a pair of Microraptorines that are of use. We have Genuine Long, who is about the same size as Velociraptor and has primary feathers that are about twice the length of the hand. We have Sinornithosaurus, which is about half the size of Velociraptor, but their wing feathers are about the length of the hand. Now, if feathers present difficulties when we're trying to restore them and say this is exactly what it was, eyes are that but more so. We haven't talked about eyes very much on this show, as evidenced by the fact that our animations usually just put a little hole there, but eyes vary really widely, even between very closely related animals, because the form of the eye is dictated by the function of the eye, how the animal is using its vision in large part determines what its eyes are going to look like. But without any direct evidence, which I don't, I, I guess you could maybe have a dinosaur's eye preserved in amber someday, that's not impossible, but lacking that kind of direct evidence, all we can do is say, well, if we look at living archosaurs, crocodilians and birds, there are certain circumstances that seem to correlate with such and such eye. So what we're really asking is, for an animal that filled Velociraptor's ecological role in Velociraptor's clade, are crocodile-like slit pupils reasonable? And the answer is, surprisingly, yeah? There is 2011 research comparing the scleral rings of various animals, including Velociraptor. 
That's the circle of bone that you sometimes see in the orbit, the eye socket of dinosaurs. It tells us two things, the focal length of the eye and the size of the aperture, the size of the opening of the pupil. Uh, combined, those give us the F number. If an animal has a low F number, that means they're adapted to low light conditions. If they have a high F number, they're adapted to high light conditions. And those researchers found that Velociraptor do have low F numbers. They're, they have what's called scotopic eyes. They are suited to nocturnal or crepuscular lifestyle, which is they're active during twilight, either in the morning or evening. So watch out, mammals. Velociraptor's coming for you. However, Protoceratops, which we know from direct fossil evidence that Velociraptor at least sometimes preyed on, uh, is not strictly nocturnal. Uh, they have uh, what's called mesopic eyes, so they're not really well adapted to either uh, low light or high light. That would imply that Protoceratops are either also crepuscular or uh, what's called cathemeral, which is kind of a catch-all term for they're active whenever they're hungry which is not uncommon in large herbivores. They'll, you know, you, you will sometimes see cows out at night grazing and they're perfectly happy. Those researchers concluded that it is plausible that the famous fighting dinosaurs incident occurred in twilight or low light conditions. So we can fill in that detail in our artwork. So we can tentatively say that Velociraptor would need to be able to see well at night, but also retain color vision so that they could see well in low light, twilight, morning, evening conditions. There's a living archosaur that fits that profile, and that profile has slit pupils. It's crocodilians. So how do slits help? Well, when light enters the eye, it bends, it diffracts, and shorter wavelengths, the violet end of the spectrum, bend more. And so they converge, that is, they focus too far forward, so that the image that actually reaches the retina has crossed over again and is blurry. Diurnal animals like us don't care. Our pupils are generally narrowed with deep focus. But partially or fully nocturnal animals have their pupils wide to let in as much light as possible. But they have a very shallow depth of field, especially predators. They can't afford to throw out any of those wavelengths. So they have what's called multifocal lenses. This uh, has differentiated bands so that the different light spectrums will focus approximately where they need to be. You lose a little bit, but you gain those wavelengths that you were completely unable to use before. The problem is, what if it's morning and evening and the pupil narrows again? Now light isn't going through all of those fancy bands you have. But with a slit, it still can. Now, in living dinosaurs, birds, multifocal lenses are really common, but slit pupils are not. This might be because if you look at a bird in daylight, they actually keep their pupils fairly dilated. They might have just such excellent eyes, I have a citation for that, birds' eyes are objectively excellent, that they don't have the problems that slit pupils evolved to remedy. So that was all a long way of saying that Slit pupils are actually quite reasonable until and unless we find evidence of bird-like vision in dromaeosaurs. We're rubbing up against an issue that occurs a lot with dromaeosaurs where we assume because they're such bird-like animals that any of the unknowns we have can just get filled in with bird stuff and that'll be close enough. Except we know and we have known for a long time even though Barsbold's work wasn't known in the West yet uh, that different parts of avian anatomy evolved at different times and usually for different purposes than they were ultimately used for in birds. So we can't do that. We, we should be very careful, in fact, about just filling it in with bird stuff. Or indeed frog DNA. I don't, I don't think we should leave that part in. <laughs> Mind you, I don't think that this look of raptor persists solely because it's a cool look. I think people, audiences, had an emotional connection to the raptors in Jurassic Park, so we should probably address why the behaviors were wrong too. The raptors in those films run as fast as cheetahs and are, quote, astonishing jumpers. They hunt in packs. They 
use their toe claws to slash, and they're extremely intelligent, demonstrating problem-solving abilities. Let's start with locomotion. There is an extremely prevalent trope in dromaeosaurs of the stiff, rod-like tail. Most of these toys have it to some extent, but these toys are the most explicit. This originates with Ulstrom and his initial thoughts on Deinonychus. He later changed his mind, but at first he thought that they would be using their tail with its uh, reinforcing bony rods as a sort of pendulum to control their trajectory while running around. However, we know, based on a preserved, articulated velociraptor tail, which is bent in an S-curve, that their tail could flex about. I demonstrated this in Deinonychus with pencils, but the bundles of rods above and below their tail were more oval-shaped than round, and they were stacked more vertically than in big round bunches. So the flexibility of the tail is what's called anisotropic. It would bend side to side quite a bit, but not so much up and down. So the rods were helping them keep their tails up. Cool, but why was that necessary? Other dinosaurs hold their tails up without any problems. Well, maybe it was because they were also supporting the weight of a tail frond or tail fan. I'm using frond to mean, like on this guy, where there's pinaceous feathers, uh, retresses, all the way down the tail. And I'm using fan to mean like on this guy, where there's basically no pinaceous feathers until right near the tip. We do not know which situation Velociraptor had, or if it even had either of them. It's reasonable to conclude that it would have had some tail feathers, just based on bracketing. But based on related animals, the jury's a bit out. Microraptor has a fan. Our friends uh, Genuan Long and Cyanornithosaurus both have fronds. Some 2017 workers working on a related animal found that there are some features on the sides of the tail vertebrae that might be anchor points for pinaceous tail feathers, for retresses. I don't know whether Velociraptor has those, uh, but I noticed that they seem to start at that same point that Velociraptor's tail transitions from being very flexible near the base to being uh, rigid and rod reinforced. Uh, further out, which is right around vertebrae 6 and 7, caudal vertebrae 6 and 7. That said, I don't know how heavy a tail frond or tail fan would be. Uh, it seems that having those tail stiffening rods is not related to any kind of aerodynamic function, because even though more basal animals don't have the rods, they do still have that transition point between more flexible near the body and less flexible further out. So before there was even the chance of them using it for any kind of flight or aerodynamic maneuvering, they already had that transition. It would seem that the rods are a byproduct of miniaturization. They're actually ossified tendons, like what we saw in certain long-necked sauropods. What it does is allow precise motor control without having heavy muscles out away from the center of mass of the creature. Um, or in Velociraptor's case, uh, it allows muscular control of the tail even with their very reduced caudal muscles, tail muscles. Indeed, Velociraptor's tail muscles are very small. Uh, dromaeosaurs in general have reduced tail musculature, so the animals here that have a really narrow little tail are actually more accurate than the ones that have the big beefy tail with the muscles flowing into the back of the leg, like we would want in a more basal theropod. Um, we talked about in Carnotaurus, the cotofemoralis longus and the other tail muscles that anchor at the bottom of the tail and the back of the femur that are used for running. Those, like all the other tail muscles, are reduced in Velociraptor, so it's reasonable to conclude that they wouldn't be strong runners. Similarly, their lower legs it's probably clearest if you look at these two. Their lower legs are proportionally really short, even by dromaeosaur standards. And it's true that these animals were at that point in the dinosaur family tree that they would be walking more from the knee joint than from the hip joint. But 
even correcting for that, they still have really short little foot bones, which implies that they would not be fast runners. This is because the leg below the knee determines their stride length, and everything else being equal, a shorter stride length is always going to be slower than a longer stride length. Dromaeosaurs in general seem to have been worse runners than their troodontid relatives, and lack, uh, Velociraptor at least, lacks the Arctometatarsus, which is that arrangement of foot bones where the middle bone can use the other two foot bones sort of like a shock absorber, which is an adaptation for running, which again, Velociraptor lacks. All of this led workers in 2011 to conclude that Dromaeosaurus and Velociraptor were likely ambush hunters. So if we continue on down, we reach the foot and the question of could a Velociraptor slash you across the belly if you were alive at the same time. The sickle claw, as you can see in these toys, and you can distinctly not see in toys like this or this was held off the ground. There's some 2019 research on Deinonychus that is useful. Uh, they looked at the tendons uh, surrounding the sickle claw and found that similar to how if you just hold your hand out and just relax your fingers, but then pull your wrist back without doing anything to your fingers, your fingers curl. It's called tendon tendinesis grasp. Um, similar to that, when Velociraptor's foot, or Deinonychus's foot, was in its neutral position, its claw would be resting up. The purpose of this is to keep the claw sharp. If you're walking on the claw all the time, it's going to get dulled and it's not going to be useful as a weapon. And it was definitely used as a weapon, but was it used for slashing? Uh, that idea seems to come from the incredible range of motion of the leg, foot, and toe joints. Uh, as early as 1983, Barsvold was pointing out that attacking with one foot while trying to pursue your prey requires a high degree of equilibrium and balance. More likely, probably, that the animal would let its body weight or gravity or its arms hold the prey and then it would kick out rather than do that kind of ballet to try and bring its claws into striking range. The aforementioned 2019 paper on Deinonychus is again illuminating. They looked at how they could optimize the amount of force transferred through the tip of the claw, and they found that a flexed limb posture actually produces the most. They also found that the animal's anatomy was not great at transferring weight through the claw, but it would have been good at grasping. I point out that both grasping and kicking with the legs still flexed are things that the fighting dinosaurs Velociraptor is doing. On the subject of grasping, we need to look at the hallux, which is a fancy term for the first toe, which on some of these they are cheating. They're using it as a strut to keep the animal upright, which I don't necessarily hate, except that this looks exactly like what you would see in a bird. Whereas what you really want, this one is better, where it's just the very tip of the toe. Also, this one's cheating anyway by having the fingertips holding it. Um, but yes, the hallux was not used for walking on, but we've noticed that, in Deinonychus at least, the first toe roughly opposes the fourth toe, which means that the first, second, and fourth toe could all be grasping at something while the second toe was doing its job of injuring it. This squares with the 2011 model of raptor prey restraint feeding, which, based partially on modern raptors, has the animal on top of whatever it's eating, grasping it with its feet, keeping it pinned with the first, second, and fourth toes, using its wings either for balance or to shroud what it's doing from uh, other interested parties, and using its mouth to eat. Then again, we have the fighting dinosaurs Velociraptor, which clearly has one of its feet extended with all of its toes except the second one uh, retracted. While we're on the subject of the claw, most of these toys have fairly conservatively sized sickle claws, 
We don't know exactly how big it would be because keratin sheaths are difficult to predict just based on the bony core that survives in fossils, but uh, it could have been like twice as long as the bone and the bone is five centimeters. Admittedly, you probably don't want to have a giant blade on a children's toy. That seems like a bad idea. Final notes on the feet would be that, based on trackway evidence, we have no trackway evidence for Velociraptor in particular, but we have related Deinonychosaurs of similar size and morphology. We know for sure that they did walk only on two toes, because we have what are called didactyl tracks. Uh, we also know that the larger the animal, the more of a pad it would have at the base of its toes. So on Velociraptor, we would expect to see a little bit of one, and it doesn't look like any of these toys really have such a thing. Well, this one kind of does. I, I, I hate to refer to this one in, as a positive, although it does have an, a, a nice curvy tail laterally while being straight up and down. So maybe they were listening. Or maybe they were accidentally right. That seems more likely. <laughs> An interesting thing about one of the trackways uh, that might apply to Velociraptor is that it's a group of animals all moving in the same direction. There is very little evidence to suggest that Velociraptors, or indeed any Dromaeosaurs, uh, hunted in packs. Pack hunting is a really sophisticated behavior. Very few mammals actually do it, and mammals in general are quite smart. There's a really persistent trope in paleo art that any Tenontosaurus will be beset instantly by groups of Deinonychus. This is based on a bone bed we found with several Deinonychus individuals all apparently having grouped up to feed on a dead Tenontosaurus. Now, this could mean that those Deinonychus had grouped up to take down a very large prey animal, but it could also mean that the prey animal was dead by some other means, and a bunch of other unrelated Deinonychus all just showed up to opportunistically feed. This is maybe more likely, seeing as these are diapsids after all, um, that this agonistic feeding behavior is a more parsimonious explanation than pack hunting, but as usual, we need more evidence. Now you might say, but raptors are intelligent. Maybe they could use the really intelligent behavior of pack hunting. Well, not clear. Um, the raptors being hyper-intelligent in Jurassic Park is really cool because it dispels a long-standing myth that dinosaurs just in general were stupid. Dinosaurs were presumed to be reptiles, and reptiles were presumed to be stupid. Paraves, like Velociraptor, like other dromaeosaurs, are subject to a slightly more sophisticated bias. The parts of birds' brains were named by researchers to correspond to the names of the basal ganglia in mammals. Which might be confusing, but basically it means that just based on those terms, it's assumed that birds are using much less sophisticated structures to do all of their brain power stuff. There are some ways that we can try to estimate animals' intelligence. We can look at the brain-to-body ratio, the four-brain-to-body ratio. We can look at neuron counts, but none of them are particularly good at predicting intelligence. It, it seems like they're only really good at general trends, and with extinct animals, we're in the dark because we can't test their intelligence. That was kind of the point of Jurassic Park, including intelligence. It's like, we had no way of knowing that they were going to be like this. The brain case of Velociraptor has been described. It's fairly similar to what we see in Archaeopteryx. Um, we can say that more of their brain was devoted to smell than birds have, uh, and we know that they lacked this particular structure that's used for taking in um, visual and somatosensory, that is a, a sense of touch uh, inputs, and transferring them to motor controls, which makes sense uh, that they wouldn't really need that as much as an animal that can fly. But as far as problem-solving ability goes, we may never know. I've mentioned several times the fighting dinosaur specimen, where a velociraptor is preserved kicking at a protoceratops, who is in turn pinning the velociraptor's leg and biting its arm. It is, without exaggeration, the most exquisite fossil we've ever found, simply because it preserves that behavior. 
That said, I think we should be tentative about extrapolating from it too much. Like, we tend to look at that and say, oh hey, Velociraptor liked to eat Protoceratops. We have a data point of one, and it's worth noting that the Velociraptor died in the attempt. So, it's not unlikely that they would have eaten a lot of Protoceratops. Of the megafauna that we've recovered from Jadokta, from Bionzok, uh, Protoceratops outnumbers all the other specimens combined by 15 to 1. Uh, and they're quite a bit larger and heavier than Velociraptor as well, so one imagines that if Velociraptor was eating them, it was eating them after they'd already died of other causes. And there's no shortage of little mammals to eat either, so I, I would imagine that Velociraptor attacking a Protoceratops was a fairly rare event. I did see a suggestion that maybe the Protoceratops was stuck in unstable sand. Which makes sense, that if, if the big hunk of meat is immobilized and the Velociraptor, which is much lighter, can still walk on top of the sand, uh, that's an opportunity that it probably wouldn't be able to pass up. Obviously it went wrong, but I can respect its gumption. What seems to have happened is that it's twilight in the desert. Protoceratops is facing uphill, and Velociraptor attacks from behind and to the right. But something immediately goes wrong, and Protoceratops is able to bring its beak to bear. Velociraptor grabs at Protoceratops' face with both of its hands, but Protoceratops chomps down on Velociraptor's right arm and holds on for the next 75 million years. Velociraptor claws at Protoceratops' stomach like a cat that didn't want its belly petted. Protoceratops either crouches or collapses due to its injuries, in either case pins Velociraptor's right leg. So the Velociraptor, pinned by its dead or dying foe, is losing blood fast from its arm wound. The animals lay like that for some time. It's not clear whether they both died at the same time, but eventually Velociraptor's neck gets pulled into that characteristic S-curve as it dries. They might have been partially buried alive by a collapsing dune or a sandstorm. It seems that something pulled Protoceratops partially off of Velociraptor, dislocating its shoulder. This is probably scavengers, but Barsbold suggests that it was other Protoceratops trying to rescue their friend. I didn't want to include that detail because it's speculation and heartbreaking, but I have a lot of respect for the fact that Barsbold is still publishing uh, in his 80s, so all I can do is report on what he thinks. So having spent this entire episode essentially complaining about Jurassic Park, I would like to at least extend an olive branch that their narrative and meta-narrative goals did align with my own goals. They wanted to show that the bad guys in their movie acted on incomplete information and it turned out badly for them because dinosaurs were not what they were expecting. You might say their dinosaurs were wrong. <laughs> but now we do have a lot more information. We can fill in a lot of the gaps with Velociraptor without needing frog DNA for some reason. So we have what I would call a duty to Velociraptor to continue using it as essentially the mascot of new look dinosaurs. And I want to thank you all for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to do all of the things that people say at the ends of these videos, and we will see you next time. We would like to send a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.